Yeah, hello everyone. It's nice to see you in such a large number here. So, uh, we at Eternas built quite cool and interesting things. Um, as you see, here we go. We go to Antarctica with our devices, not ourselves. We build laser systems, we play with drones, uh, we track animals, and we do plenty of interesting things with IoT and other technologies. So overall, as an innovation lab, we have the freedom to try some new and exciting things. Um, you may have seen my talks in the previous years. So in 2018, at the first conference, we were talking about drone mapping of LoRaWAN coverage and how to build useful things with that. Last year, we decided to go closer to water. So we've looked underwater, we've looked near water and tried to figure out how well LoRaWAN works there. And this year, we're taking this a notch up. So the year 2020, I would like to talk about the number 20. As we are discussing the 20 plus years for IoT devices. So here's a question for you all. Who owns or operates an IoT device that they deployed in year 2000 or earlier and it still works today? One, a few hands. And really what we are seeing today is the industry is moving towards the 20 year lifetime as IoT devices are becoming integrated into the products. So they're moving from being embedded, uh, so, sorry, they're moving from being add-ons, like here's a nice IoT device, you take it and you attach it to something, towards this is a product, it's fully connected, it's lifecycle managed, and it has IoT connectivity inside. So overall, if we have the freedom on the products to achieve 20 year lifetime, we will make money only if we minimize truck roll. So this is a very nice definition, and here's a nice Lego truck, and you can play around with this uh, for your application and see what's the effort, is what does it take for someone to go out and service the device if something fails? And if you want 20 year lifetime, every time someone needs to attend to it, you will fail essentially, and you will lose quite a lot of money. And to be able to build things that will last that long, we divide the project always into five different aspects. We look at power, like how can we power the device for such a long time and make sure everything survives? We definitely need to make it sufficiently durable so it will stand all the crazy conditions these devices uh, can be under. And we're talking about the applications which is not an indoor temperature sensor, but it's somewhere out in the wild or somewhere out in the industrial environment. From the connectivity point, we've heard a lot today and LoRa and LoRaWAN really enable us to do a lot, however, we always think about the devices with local connectivity, with remote connectivity, where we put LoRaWAN in, and even with backup connectivity, uh, should that fail or figure out how to do things with that. As we see the constant evolution, and if you listen to the panel before and the story of LoRaWAN, you see there's a lot based in software, and more so the trend is things are software-based, um, and the hardware can be upgraded uh, with uh, the functionalities. So we always want to keep the option to upgrade things over time and manage them so they will work correctly. And at the end, I cannot stress this enough, this is about testing. The more you test, the more it works. And unless you've tested and proven it works, it doesn't. That's pretty much uh, the main explanation. So we'll dive into all of the five topics through a number of different use cases. And we'll start with one that I like very much our beloved rhinos. So firstly, you know, we want to conserve the environment. So what happens is rhinos get relocated from one area to the other, and we want to understand how they will use the new area. We want to make sure they are well in the area. And over a longer period of time, we want to follow them to see they're alive, they're healthy, and they don't get poached. But for us, as a technical development team, rhinos are testers. We need to build something that withstands the rhino. That's pretty much uh, the environment. And we love doing animal conservation use cases because this is what, how we can test things for industry. Like if it survives a rhino, well, we can prove it will work in a number of different, more industrial environments. If it works in a different case, we'll again make the same story. So just jumping into the rhino GPS tracker. So the devices you can see at R and Smart Park's uh, desk by the entrance, if you're interested. They're super small GPS trackers with LoRaWAN connectivity and a primary battery cell inside. 
So the size is very limited, and we need to pack this size with as much of battery capacity as possible, because the more battery you have, the more GPS fixes uh, you get. The goal of the whole project is maximize the number of GPS fixes and LoRaWAN messages you can get out of one device in two years. So why two years? In this case, the Rhino horn will grow out in two years. So that is the maximum lifetime. Luckily, it's not 20, because that makes things uh, more difficult. And the highest density power source we have available is a primary lithium cell. The interesting aspect of the power consumption broken down here is mostly it's about GPS. GPS fixes take a lot of uh, time here. Um, to be able to even show LoRa transmissions, we had to put the spread factor to 12, because at SF7, it's just such a negligible part of the power consumption of the device, we couldn't even show it on this slide. And quite rarely, you run the device at that spread factor. Jumping into a different use case uh, with SenseStick, this uh, nice small um, temperature, uh, pressure, and humidity sensor uh, from our colleagues in uh, Slovenia, we're doing optimization in semiconductor plants. So there, it's all about the yield. The better you can control your, your environment, the better you control your machines, the better you control everything, the better you can optimize your process and get the maximal yield. As simple as that. And you can do quite simple correlation matrices, and the return of investment is quickest there. So you, can't, you don't need to be very, very smart with that. But as soon as you have data, you see immediate improvements uh, in the process. And I'm talking about these devices from the power aspect. So it's nice and small, double, triple A uh, batteries inside um, of a no-name brand. We've tried different ones, and we've really seen that from just two triple A batteries, we can get 300,000 LoRaWAN messages, including the measurements here. So you take that number, you split that number any way you like across five or so years, possibly even more, and you get the data. If you are in a closed environment, you can really push down the spread spectrum and just send out the data, 1,000 packets a day, uh, and see where that takes you. Um, or just stretch it out. But we really think on the devices how many useful actions we can perform within the battery life of this. Durability becomes the critical one when you take devices out of controlled indoor-type environments outside. So we work with OpenCaller on creating solutions for tracking various animals. Um, but we like to say, you know, there's a buffalo, so, or a bison, however it's called. And if the device will survive this, it will survive a bunch of other use cases which are not as tough. And you, know, you see various power drinks and energy drinks all use animals as kind of sign of power and force. So we think about this as well. From the perspective of how we can build the most compact device as a technology um, to achieve the GPS tracking case again here is we have our size limitation because it needs to fit on an animal without um, too much uh, trouble. Uh, we need to do GPS tracking, but at the same time, because we have a rechargeable battery, we use this device as a tracker which monitors DC power. So applications you can think of this as you can put it in a car it will charge from the car battery. You can put it on a motorbike. It will charge from the motorbike battery. Or you can monitor whatever devices you have in the field. And if they get stolen, you get the GPS location. Hey, I'm running away and come, kind of come, come find me. Um, but at the same time, it's a very good animal tracker. Um, so the applications are many, but it needs to be really, really tough. So the only way we uh, figured out how to do this is we pot this into one solid block um, of resin. That gives us the minimal possible physical size of the device, and it's resistant to water and dust and like force. We take a hammer, we smash the device, it still works, and so forth. So it really takes a beating um, to show this. Now, getting to that point is quite easy, actually. Um, so you can build a large volume of molds. Um, you put the devices and electronics inside, um, and they will work. But the critical part here is the RF, so wireless communications. Antenna tuning really breaks down in that environment. Um, because you change the medium uh, around the antenna, you need to do significant tuning. And for example, here on the antenna, you can see 
how much we've modified it to bring it to the right frequency when we put the resin uh, around. When you know how much it offsets things, uh, you can compensate for that, and then you can build the devices in series. For example, for GPS, we see like a 20 megahertz shift uh, with uh, typical epoxy resins. For uh, embedded LoRaWAN antennas, so not the one with the photo here, which is just the wire, but the ones that we have on the PCB, it can shift for 100, 150 megahertz. So it's not 868 anymore, but it's way, way lower. So you need to do significant effort to be able to tune this. However, the challenge becomes you're tuning a very small device with way too small of a ground plane inside an epoxy resin. So how to go about this? Well, you can be a bit smarter in the electronics. So we've been working with Fabian Ferrero um, and creating two solutions that you can build into the device, either at the test phase or for every device that you use. So you can build in a VSWR meter. So that gives you the efficiency of your antenna, so you get the reflected power and you know how good your tuning is. And with the LoRa transceiver, you can nicely do a frequency sweep up and down and you see exactly where your antenna is. Um, so if you just do the measurement, you modify the antenna, pot another device, repeat the process until you are at the right frequency. But hey, think of our buffalo or our rhino. The environment around actually changes. So also the tuning around our device uh, will uh, actually change. So we can build in digitally tunable elements so the device can actively tune the antenna to whatever the environment uh, you throw it in. It's underwater, fine. You will compensate a bit for that. It's inside a horn, you will compensate for that a bit. Someone installs it in a car, in a dash somewhere, it will find the best possible configuration for that. And with this, we can improve the battery life, we can improve the performance, and we can make quite a nice solution. And now we get to an interesting use case, which is smart grid monitoring. So you all know, you know electrical towers, wires. There's a lot of large, heavy, expensive objects that make the electrical grid run. And here we're not talking about just the electrical grid itself, but also the structural elements within. And the goal is really to do life cycle monitoring. Certain of these components need to be inspected, say, once a year. So someone goes there, climbs the tower, pushes a button, shakes it a bit, looks at it. Does it still work? Yes, check, move along. And that's very tedious, which means it does not get done as often as it should. And that then leads to catastrophic failures and ultimately leads to larger costs for the customer. But the conditions for building a solution for something like this are very, very extreme. So they need, the device needs to work for 20 plus years outdoors. Why? Because the lifetime of the object the device is bundled with is that or even more. And today on the electrical grid, there's quite a lot of solutions that have been deployed before I was born. So imagine quite some uh, years already. Um, imagine the high voltage scenarios, like you get lightning strikes, you get tens of kilovolts uh, on those lines. And also things can break down and devices can fall down. So it also needs to survive the fall, or at least the beginning of the fall, as we'll see in some applications later on. So as we've been dealing with the different smart grid projects, the key question is, can LoRaWAN devices work reliably in such cases? Well, there's only one way to find out. So what we, we've prepared here is some of the test cages where we have Tesla coils. Well, why not? So we'll get this going, and you'll see two different devices in here. So you can see the fluorescent lamps inside, and if we dim everything, you'll see the electrical arcs just jumping to two IoT devices. One being here, which is built for uh, monitoring objects on the electrical grid. And here, well, here we have another one, which is the Lion Tracker. Um, so with those devices, um, we you know, generate sparks, uh, things uh, spark across. And what we can say is the devices work. So we can get bidirectional communication from a LoRaWAN device in these conditions. Unfortunately, this is a small simulated environment. We couldn't bring the real large high voltage uh, lab to you today because it's 
a large chunk of this building where we can simulate a real lightning strike, a proper electrical uh, arc being broken down, and so forth. So I dare you all bring your own LoRaWAN devices. We can put them in the cage and see what happens to them. Um, you can learn something quite interesting from that. And for example, what we've seen um, over the past years is, say, accelerometers as components on the circuit board are quite good electrical field detectors. They will generate events and different kinds of measurements. So you put them in a metal cage and put them in resin, and they will survive. And there's a large number of those tricks uh, that you need to do for this to work. But the key part is LoRa actually works perfectly in such conditions. And we'll put this to um, our booth so we can come have a closer look, play with all of the devices. And that brings us to connectivity. So we know connectivity can work in really extreme cases, in really difficult applications. And with LoRaWAN, we're forming a consortium now where we'll, we'll do very rigorous testing of this. So we can go to applications like this, right? So this is a real scenario. Slovenia 2016, I think, uh, with a large ice cost. So what happens here is your electrical grid goes down, like literally goes down. Physically, wires fall down, towers lean, things break. And the fastest way you can restore the service is you need to know what, like what broke. This tower, this location, this wire. So you can figure out what's the minimal amount of effort you need to do to restore the service. And the only way you can do this if you have a smart grid uh, solution. So you can monitor the towers, you can monitor the wires, you can monitor the mounting elements, and you exactly see where what is. Otherwise, people sit in cars and drive for hours until they figure out what is wrong with this application. So we're retesting with all of the devices, with all of the applications, to make sure they survive such conditions. And we say, if it works on a rhino and a buffalo, and then you take it to somewhere cold, like Antarctica, there's a very good chance it will work here uh, as well from all the lessons we've learned in that case. So we work with a company called Isoelectro to create surge arrestor leakage monitoring uh, devices. So this is an interesting one. Um, so this is the element that kind of takes the lightning strike to ground instead to your uh, sockets in the wall, so it protects from over, over, so from over voltage uh, situations uh, in these cases. And the more lightning strikes this gets, the worse it performs. And at some point, it is essentially worn out. But you need to know that case. And currently, there are really no very good ways how to do this, so we've created uh, the solutions with Isoelectro so they can install it on their devices, retrofit it, and get instant alerts, hey, like scheduled maintenance or replace this device um, so you won't have a problem uh, later on. Because what happens is when something like this fails and you don't know which of the elements has failed, you go and clump a lot of towers until you find the one that's faulty. And you may not even see it uh, by hand. So it's a lot of man hours and all of that. So search, raster monitoring, it's a breeze for LoRaWAN as well. Talking about cold temperatures, well, you know, take things to Antarctica, see what happens there. And so we have the devices there. I've, we've mentioned it last year as well, but we took it a step further. So we are now uh, revising the device and the design, adding lacuna connectivity, so we can get real-time status reports even from Antarctica at low power, at low cost, uh, in all the situations. And from the perspective of connectivity, I'd like particularly to mention Lacuna because it creates a unique situation we've not ever seen before with satellite connectivity. Being that the same device talks to the terrestrial network and to the satellite the constellation. Simply means if we have the electrical grid application where our gateways go down, where there's no power, there's no cell phone network. Also, we won't get data from our LoRa devices. But for example, if they're designed with the right antenna, the rest of the hardware is the same, we will get one ping a day or however many satellite passes are available. Hey, the device says, I'm here, and th this is like a limited status report we can get out of it. But actually, that's all you need in very critical situations. And imagine you are 
a device vendor. You want your customer to be very responsive to whatever happens. And if the device has a good way of telling you, hey, like the gateways I'm talking to are down, you can call your customer, hey, your gateways are down. And you will solve the problem much quicker than if they call you and say, hey, your devices don't work, but the problem is in gateways or somewhere up the stack or somewhere else. Um, and this is really key and really helpful. Another application uh, where we are doing this thing in particular is in Africa, so working with smart parks uh, and Lacuna, we track elephants. Now, tracking an elephant, how difficult can it be? Like, it's a large animal, it doesn't go very far, but actually that's not the case. Um, so they will roam large distances. If you're lucky, they will be in one reserve or kind of be in one area. So that's perfect. You can have your lower gateways up, you can talk to them from the device normally. But at the same time, if the elephant kind of runs out, goes somewhere else, there's a good chance it will be on a path of destruction, going through villages, fields, and it will be danger um, to people, property, and so forth. Um, and if you're out of range, well, you're out of range. There's no way uh, you can work with this. However, uh, with Lacuna connectivity, you can then get at least some data back uh, wherever you are in the world. And given it's same hardware, and given that if you use antenna optimized for satellite operation, it just so happens the terrestrial coverage works very well as well. So uh, it's kind of a perfect solution uh, for both cases. And there's one more requirement for the connectivity. We also need something that works locally. And the local part is quite important because it enables two things. If you in any way mess up your LoRaWAN connectivity, you don't need to put the animal to sleep, take the collar off, plug in a cable, upgrade the firmware upgrade you messed up, and then uh, put it back up. But you can kind of get within the distance of, say, Bluetooth range of you know, 10 to 50 meters, um, press the upgrade button and see what's happening. So if something fails, that's your fail safe. You can get some local access. But there's also the additional benefit of having a local connectivity because you can offload large chunks of data. For example, an elephant, we can generate megabytes of data of, say, accelerometer movement, of temperature, of whatever you particularly like. Um, and if, say, you place a gateway, so Bluetooth to Wi-Fi or anything like that, or even just a hard drive with a Bluetooth interface, whenever the phone, when the elephant will be in the range, say next to a watering hole, you can just download however much data you can. And that works perfectly in that case as well. So that's why we always advocate for local connectivity, remote connectivity, and backup connectivity, if at all possible, because that gives you the maximum chance of success, while with, say, LoRa and Bluetooth, it doesn't cost that much in hardware uh, in any case. Speaking about upgrades, imagine the use case we have with uh, InkTech. Um, it's monitoring railway infrastructure. So the use case here is you can put in train tunnels. Easy, right? You just put in the tunnel. It's there. It will send data. Well, yes. However, these are quite secure facilities. Trains run past at very high speeds. And you can't just shut off a railway line and hope no one will notice, so we need to change a battery in a sensor, right? Or, well, you had a bad firmware upgrade, and, well, it's not responding. You need to go there again. With local connectivity, well, in the minimal case, you can take a slow train through and kind of upgrade things uh, as you go by. Even if you just need to go there by hand, you can use your phone, press the upgrade instead of screwdrivers, taking it off, swapping the device, and you will save a lot of man hours. Think about, say, the um, electrical grid use case in terms of upgrades. The worst thing you can do if you have a, say, Bluetooth-enabled device and you've messed something up with your LoRa connectivity is you can take a drone and kind of fly along and push upgrades. It's not perfect. You don't ever want to do that. But it's a lot, lot better than someone climbing up, uninstalling that, putting a new device on, and coming back down. So th these are all very, very important considerations. And lastly, if you don't want to have things uh, go wrong, it's all about automated testing. 
and how to better think about automatic testing than pangolins. Like, who doesn't love pangolins? But they exhibit a very interesting story on the scenarios of use cases. So on a perfect day, it will nicely stroll along, you know, not too thick forest, you will get GPS positions back, and it's all good. But these animals sometimes can go underground, they will nest in the worst uh, possible positions. Essentially, they will change environments and use cases very, very quickly. And you need to be sure that your device survives all of these use cases. It's fully autonomous, so it will recover from those, um, because you can't just have it turned on. Your battery is limited, and with GPS, you can quite quickly burn through that if you're not smart about uh, what you're doing. So from the perspective of automated testing, we always first prioritize power. Why power? Because that is what keeps your device alive. If it's not solar powered, you have a fixed amount of power budget, and you know exactly how much each operation costs you in terms of power. So firstly, we need to make sure every device we build consumes the right amount of power. Not too much, not too little. So we set thresholds, and we make sure every device is within those ranges in all of the operations of the device. Then we check every firmware release to see, does it use more power? Does it use less power? Because just a wrong configuration of an input pin uh, on a low power device will add, say, 50 microamps. And 50 microamps adds up quite quickly if you try to do 20 years of lifetime. And also, just normal operation. You really want to optimize what you're doing, and you really need to see the power. So we've been working with and using the Coitec solution. Um, you can see that on their booth um, to measure power consumption of the devices. But also, we've been building on their API and creating software that automatically checks every device, checks every state of power. And essentially, it almost comes to the point where we can say how much power every line of code in the device takes. And then you can optimize, because you see you're not blind anymore. And you can simulate scenarios and take this further. As we're not very happy with uh, testing overall, and we see the problem, hey, like we want to test in real environment, but we are in our office at our desk, what we can do about this? So we've actually created another company now called Testnik, where we teleport developers to various locations. Let that be NBIT, let that be LoRaWAN. It simply means. You sit at your desk with your microcontroller, and your modem is somewhere far, far away in a network of one provider or in a different country. And you see what's doing there and how much power it's consuming. Um, so feel free to reach out if you want to learn more. Particularly, we're interested in understanding like, what do you guys want to test, and you can't test today. So feel free to see me afterwards and give your input. And to sum up, uh, the today's talk is we want to make IoT devices outlive a turtle. That's a dream, right? It will take 100 years. Um, if we want something that lasts 100 years, I'm not entirely sure we know how to build it today, unless it's made out of stone, but it's definitely not connected uh, in that case. We can do 20 years. So the technology is here. Um, the development effort is significant. So that's, we should work together. We work on using open tools and collaborating to be able to do things right and correctly without too much effort. And as we say, you need to power a durable device with upgradable connectivity and automated testing, and you'll be good. So I hope the, today's talk gave you insight in a lot of different applications from industrial to animals and kind of sparked your imagination, showing you that you can abuse LoRa on connectivity quite a bit and it will still work. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. And that's it.